Vault Dweller Survival Guide, issued by Vault Tech Documentation Department, January 2077. Notice, this document contains information affecting the national defense of the United States within the meaning of the new amended Espionage Act 50 U.S.C. 31 and 32. Its transmission or the revelation of its contents in any matter to an unauthorized person is prohibited by law. Section 1. Welcome to the Vault of the Future. Welcome to Vault 13, the latest in a series of public defense works from vault Tech, your contractor of choice when it comes to the best in nuclear shelters. vault Tech, America's final word in homes. This document, VTB001, the Vault Dweller Survival Guide, is for the events following a worldwide nuclear war. In the case of a limited-scale nuclear war or other world-ending catastrophe, please refer to the appropriate documentation. See also pages 1 through 8. End of world cause, document number, and title. Limited-scale nuclear war. VTB-002, Vault Dweller Survival Guide Abridged Version. Disease, VTD-001, Coping with Mr. Virus. Starvation, VTR-003, How to Eat Rat. Flooding, VTF-100, Flotation Homes and Seaweed. Meteor, VTM-020B, How to Dodge Falling Rocks. The Vault series of survival shelters are designed from the ground up to provide the best chance for a good life following nuclear Armageddon. It is the duty of every American citizen to learn and use the skills necessary for a comfortable Vault life. The best place to start is with a description of your new home. Important Vault Statistics Vault Number 13 Starting Construction Date August 2063 Ending construction date March 2069 Starting budget 400 billion US dollars Final budget with interest 645 billion US dollars Total number of occupants 1000 at capacity Total duration 10 years at capacity Number of living quarters, 100. Hot bunking required if at maximum capacity. Door thickness, 4 yards, steel. Earth coverage, 3,200,000 tons of soil at 200 feet. Computer control system, think machine. Primary power supply, geothermal. Secondary power supply, General Atomics nuclear power backup systems. Power requirements, 3.98 megakilowatts per day. Stores, complete construction equipment, hydro-agricultural farms, water purification from underground river, defense weaponry to equip 10 men, communication, social and entertainment files for total duration. Nuclear blast effects. Vault 13 is designed to provide protection from the effects of a nuclear blast. To better understand the protection provided, we have included a section from the High Energy Weapons FAQ that explains how a nuclear blast causes damage. The first thing bomb victims experience is the intense flux of photons from the blast, which releases 70 to 80% of the bomb's energy. The effects go up to third-degree thermal burns and are not a pretty sight. Initial deaths are due to this effect. The next phenomenon is the supersonic blast front. You see it before you hear it. The pressure front has the effect of blowing away anything in its path. After the front comes the overpressure phase. It would feel like being underwater a few hundred meters. At a few thousand meters under the sea, pressurized holes implode. The pressure gradually dies off, and there is a negative overpressure phase, with a reversed blast wind. This reversal is due to air rushing back to fill the void left by the explosion. The air gradually returns to normal atmospheric pressure, 
At this stage, fires caused by electrical destruction and ignited debris turn the place into a firestorm. Then come the middle term effects, such as keloid formation and retinoblastoma. Genetic or hereditary damage can appear up to 40 years after initial radiation. Atmospheric effects of blasts. The mushroom cloud. The heat from fusion and fission instantaneously raises the surrounding air to 10 million degrees Celsius. This superheated air plasma gives off so much light that it looks brighter than the sun and is visible hundreds of kilometers away. The resultant fireball quickly expands. It is made up of hot air and hence rises at a rate of a few hundred meters per second. After a minute or so, the fireball has risen to a few kilometers and has cooled off to the extent that it no longer radiates. The surrounding cooler air exerts some drag on this rising air, which slows down the outer edges of the cloud. The unimpeded inner portion rises a bit quicker than the outer edges. A vacuum effect occurs when the outer portion occupies the vacuum left by the higher inner portion. The result is a smoke ring. The inner material gradually expands into a mushroom cloud due to convection. If the explosion is on the ground, dirt and radioactive debris get sucked up the stem, which sits below the fireball. Collisions and ionization of the cloud particles result in lightning bolts flickering to the ground. Initially, the cloud is orange-red due to a chemical reaction when the air is heated. When the cloud cools to air temperature, the water vapor starts to condense. The cloud turns from red to white. In the final stages, the cloud can get about 100 kilometers across and 40 kilometers high for a megaton class explosion. If you see a flash, duck and cover. Electromagnetic pulse, EMP. A nuclear explosion gives off radiation at all wavelengths of light. Some is in the radio slash radar portion of the spectrum, the EMP effect. The EMP effect increases the higher you go into the atmosphere. High altitude explosions can knock out electronics by inducing a current surge in closed circuit metallic objects. Electronics, power lines, phone lines, TVs, radios, etc. The damage range can be over 1,000 kilometers. Overview of immediate effects. The three categories of immediate effects are blast, thermal, radiation, heat, and prompt ionizing or nuclear radiation. Their relative importance varies with the yield of the bomb. At low yields, all three can be significant sources of injury. With an explosive yield of about 2.5 kilotons, the three effects are roughly equal. All are capable of inflicting fatal injuries at a range of one kilometer. The fraction of a bomb's yield emitted as thermal radiation, blast, and ionizing radiation is essentially constant for all yields, but the way the different forms of energy interact with air and target vary dramatically. Air is essentially transparent to thermal radiation. The thermal radiation affects exposed surfaces, producing damage by rapid heating. A bomb that is 100 times larger can produce equal thermal radiation intensities over areas 100 times larger. The area of an imaginary sphere centered on the explosion increases with the square of the radius. Thus, the destructive radius increases with the square root of the yield. This is the familiar inverse square law of electromagnetic radiation. Actually, the rate of increase is somewhat less, partly due to the fact that larger bombs emit heat more slowly, which reduces the damage produced by each calorie of heat. It is important to note that the area subjected to damage by thermal radiation increases almost linearly with yield. Blast effect is a volume effect. The blast wave deposits energy in the material it passes through, including air. When the blast wave passes through solid material, the energy left behind causes damage. When it passes through air, it simply grows weaker. The more matter the energy travels through, the smaller the effect. The amount of matter increases with the volume of the imaginary sphere centered around the explosion. Blast effects thus scale with the inverse cube law, which relates radius to volume. 
The intensity of nuclear radiation decreases with the inverse square law, like thermal radiation. However, nuclear radiation is also strongly absorbed by the air it travels through, which causes the intensity to drop off much more rapidly. These scaling laws show that the effects of thermal radiation grow rapidly with yield relative to blast, while those of radiation rapidly decline. In a small nuclear attack, bomb yield approximately 15 kilotons, casualties, including fatalities, would be seen from all three causes. Burns, including those caused by an ensuing firestorm, would be the most prevalent serious injury. Two-thirds of those who would die the first day would be burn victims, and occur at the greatest range. Blast and burn injuries would be found in 60-70% to 70 of all survivors. People close enough to suffer significant radiation illness would be well inside the lethal effects radius for blast and flash burns. As a result of only 30% of injured survivors would show radiation illness. Many of those people would be sheltered from burns and blast and thus escape the main effects. Even so, most victims with radiation illness would also have blast injuries or burns as well. With yields in the range of hundreds of kilotons or greater, typical for strategic warheads, immediate radiation injury becomes significant. Immediate radiation injury becomes insignificant. Dangerous radiation levels only exist so close to the explosion that surviving the blast is impossible. On the other hand, fatal burns can be inflicted well beyond the range of substantial blast damage. A 20 megaton bomb can cause potentially fatal third degree burns at a range of 40 kilometers, where the blast can do little more than break windows and cause superficial cuts. A convenient rule of thumb for estimating the short term fatalities from all causes due to a nuclear attack is to count everyone inside the 5 psi blast overpressure contour around the hypocenter as a fatality. In reality, substantial numbers of people inside the contour will survive and substantial numbers outside the contour will die, but the assumption is that these two groups will be roughly equal in size and balance out. Overview of Delayed Effects Radioactive Contamination the chief delayed effect is the creation of huge amounts of radioactive material with long lifetimes, half-lives ranging from days to millennia. The primary source of these products is the debris left from fission reactions. A potentially significant secondary source is neutron capture by non-radioactive isotopes both within the bomb and in the outside environment. When atoms fission, they can split in some 40 different ways, producing a mix of about 80 different isotopes. These isotopes vary widely in stability. Some are completely stable, while others undergo radioactive decay with half-lives of fractions of a second. The decaying isotopes may themselves form stable or unstable daughter isotopes. The mixture thus quickly becomes even more complex. Some 300 different isotopes of 36 elements have been identified in fission products. Short-lived isotopes release their decay energy rapidly creating intense radiation fields that also decline quickly. Long-lived isotopes release energy over long periods of time, creating radiation that is much less intense but more persistent. Fission products thus initially have a very high level of radiation that declines quickly, but as the intensity of radiation drops, so does the rate of decline. A useful rule of thumb is the rule of sevens. This rule states that for every sevenfold increase in time following a fission detonation, starting at or after one hour, the radiation intensity decreases by a factor of 10. Thus, after seven hours, the residual fission radioactivity declines 90% to one tenth of its level of one hour. After seven times seven hours, 49 hours, approximately two days, the level drops again by 90%, after 7 times 2 days, 2 weeks. It drops a further 90%, and so on for 14 weeks. The rule is accurate to 25% for the first 2 weeks, and is accurate to a factor of 2 for the first 6 months. After 6 months, the rate of decline becomes much more rapid. The rule of 7 corresponds to an approximate t to the power of negative 1.2 scaling relationship. These radioactive products are the most hazardous when they settle to the ground as fallout. The rate at which fallout settles depends very strongly on the altitude at which the explosion occurs, and to a lesser extent, on the size of the explosion. 
If the explosion is a true airburst, the fireball does not touch the ground. When the vaporized radioactive products cool enough to condense and solidify, they will do so to form microscopic particles. These particles are mostly lifted high into the atmosphere by the lower These particles are mostly lifted high into the atmosphere by the rising fireball, although significant amounts are deposited in the lower atmosphere by mixing that occurs due to convective circulation within the fireball. The larger the explosion, the higher and faster the fallout is lofted, and the smaller the proportion that is deposited in the lower atmosphere. For explosions with yields of 100 kilotons or less, the fireball does not rise above the troposphere where precipitation occurs. All of this fallout will thus be brought to the ground by weather processes within months at most, usually much faster. In the megaton range, the fireball rises so high that it enters the stratosphere. The stratosphere is dry, and no weather processes exist here to bring fallout down quickly. Small fallout particles will descend over periods of months or years. Such long-delayed fallout has lost most of its hazard by the time it comes down, and will be distributed on a global scale. As yields increase over 100 kilotons, progressively more and more of the total fallout is injected into the stratosphere. An explosion closer to the ground, close enough for the fireball to touch, sucks large amounts of dirt into the fireball. The dirt usually does not vaporize, and if it does, there is so much of it that it forms large particles. The radioactive isotopes are deposited on soil particles, which can quickly fall to Earth. Fallout is deposited over a time span of minutes to days, creating downwind contamination both nearby and thousands of kilometers away. The most intense radiation is created by nearby fallout, because it is more densely deposited and because short-lived isotopes haven't decayed yet. Weather conditions can affect this considerably, of course. In particular, rainfall can rain out fallout to create very intense localized concentrations. Both external exposure to penetrating radiation and internal exposure ingestion of radioactive material pose serious health risks. Explosions close to the ground that do not touch it can still generate substantial hazards immediately below the burst point by neutron activation. Neutrons absorbed by the soil can generate considerable radiation for several hours. The Megaton-class weapons have been largely retired, being replaced with much smaller yield warheads. The yield of a modern strategic warhead is, with few exceptions, now typically in the range of 200 to 750 kilotons. Recent work with sophisticated climate models has shown that this reduction in yield results in a much larger proportion of the fallout being deposited in the lower atmosphere, and a much faster and more intense deposition of fallout than had been assumed in studies made during the 60s and 70s. The reduction in aggregate strategic arsenal yield that occurred when high-yield weapons were retired in favor of more numerous lower-yield weapons has actually increased the fallout risk. Additional Publications Vault Dweller Survival Guide Abridged Version A condensed version of the Vault Dweller Survival Guide, containing just the important information you need. Coping with Mr. Virus, an extended pamphlet for the whole family, includes the popular How to Burn Diseased Body section. How to Eat Rat, over 101 recipes from basic meals to a complete set of dishes, all the way from snacks to desserts. Flotation Homes and Seaweed, a complete survival guide for the ocean bound. More tips, instructions, and plans than you could ever possibly use. How to Dodge Falling Rocks, available the third quarter of 2078. End of section one.